G'day everyone, I am the man called Kemo Sambi, the man they call Lucille. Lucy to my friends, the man with the plan from the land down under, the man too dangerous for YouTube, the man they tried to censor but couldn't. And this is my review of Freed, The Fourth Revenge by Carl Bircham, Ian J. Miller and Frederick Matson. Frederick asked me to review this book after I did a video review on another book he worked on. That review got my last YouTube channel permanently suspended without warning, but the video of it is still available on BitChute. I'll link it below. I was forwarded a media package that included a digital proof of the book, a making of a document, a press release and some pin-up art. This book is currently funding on the Indiegogo platform and not doing very well. I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that is later on in the video. As usual, we'll take a look at the cover and then talk about the good, the bad and the ugly of this comic. As Freed the Fourth Revenge is currently funding, this review will have less spoilers than my usual videos. The cover shows the protagonist and the antagonist back to back. While there is clearly anger between them, the image almost looks like a cranky buddy cop poster shot rather than mortal enemies locked in a murderous race across America. The art has a very frenetic energy. Even when standing still, these figures have a lot of movement. This artist definitely adheres to the techniques detailed in the classic How to Draw Comics the Marvel way, but some of the line work is a bit heavy handed. Your cover is your first port of call, don't give it anything less than your best effort. The colouring is bright, full and robust. The contrast of colours on each character enhances their unique visuals. The painted face and feathers of the antagonist are as much identifiers of his heritage as the African print material and headwear are for the protagonist. The book begins with a Native American character from the cover undergoing 50 self-inflicted cuts, bleeding himself to the point of delirium so he can embark on a vision quest. There he sees the world of the white man, skyscrapers and cities overrunning and wiping out the traditional world of the native people. The car at the mouth of the cave where he undergoes his vision quest shows us this scene happens in modern times. Believing the vision quest has given him direction, the native character prepares for the next phase of his plan. Meanwhile, Agent Keone Freed is introduced to the reader and tries to cope with the horrible crimes before her. She tells us she is a member of the SIS, the Special Investigation Squad, in Washington, D.C. She returns home, drinks liquor and swims the Potomac to try and forget what she saw. The next day at the Native American Heritage Festival, the Secretary of the Interior is savagely slain by the Native American character, who is hiding in plain sight as a performer. He eludes the police and steals some clothes to blend in and escape. Keone is woken by the arrival of the first female president of the United States, who was also her friend from college. President McQueen asks Keone to investigate the murder at the festival, saying she doesn't trust the FBI, who normally investigate federal murders, and wants someone apolitical running the show. There's a witness to the killing. The witness is an Indian kid who saw the whole thing. The kid says the killer was as good a ghost dancer as anyone he's seen, as good as his uncle before he became a drunk. Liz goes to the reservation, or the res, to find this uncle, Ben Soaring Eagle, and get his perspective on the killing. Ben is indeed drunk and says he'll talk to her if she provides him with more alcohol. She shows him a video of the killings and Ben says lots of angry young Indian men want revenge. Keone asks what for and Ben lists a bunch of battles, conflicts, massacres that happened more than 100 years ago. In the next scene, the world's greatest athlete, Jim White, is planning on announcing his retirement. The killer Indian, who is now being referred to as the Avenger, strangles White with his own medals, claiming it was revenge for crimes committed against the other Jim, Jim Thrush, also known as Crazy Horse. Ben agrees to advise Keone on the murder and they get on a flight to visit the scene of the latest murder. Ben asks Keone why she decided to become a cop and she tells him about the drug addict that killed her brother. She got a law degree to fulfill her brother's dream and became a cop to catch killers like the addict and like the Avenger. Keone asks why Ben agreed to help her if he understands why the Avenger does what he does. Ben simply replies that revenge isn't the same as justice. Meanwhile, the Avenger abducts the daughter of the director of the US Bureau of Indian Affairs. He calls Keone and taunts her with details of his plan. He dares her to meet him in the park near her home. They exchange bullets and arrows, but Keone has to cut the fight short when the Avenger tells her the director's daughter is drowning in the nearby river. Keone saves the girl, which gives the Avenger time to enact his third revenge. He cuts out the director's heart to mirror the sick, sad heart of Chief Joseph, an Indian leader who tired of fighting the white Americans. When Keone is given a close-up picture of the Avenger taken from a civilian drone camera, Ben recognises the killer as Teddy Blackbear, the son of his old hunting partner who served in Afghanistan and fell into drug and alcohol abuse when he returned from the war. The Avenger taunts Keone with a note telling her his work is nearly complete. Keone figures out the President is the next target, the fourth revenge, and she storms Air Force One to let her friend know. Keone demands to join the paratrooper team that plans to descend on the President during a 9-11 anniversary ceremony. Fortunately, she's been skydiving since she was a child, so she's able to do this. The President urges the pilot to fly them to the site of her own intended assassination and a final showdown with the Avenger, in freefall, hundreds of metres up in the sky.
This is a tight, frenetic, fast-paced, self-contained story. It's a thriller, a competent cop chasing a savage killer across America, using clues from each murder to try and get ahead of the next, only to end up lagging behind time and again. It's not a murder mystery, not a whodunit. It has more in common with the cop chasing a serial killer type stories, the Seven and Silence of the Lamb and Harry Bosch and Alex Cross type tales. The idea of a killer using ancient traditional weapons, ideas and techniques in a modern world is an interesting one, and one that could be explored more in future media. It doesn't even have to be a killer, you could just as easily create a story about a competent good guy who falls back on old school and traditional tracking, hunting and fighting methods when outnumbered and outgunned by an enemy force. That sounds familiar. Despite the Avengers' old-fashioned methods and gear, he is still a formidable opponent and even a little frightening in his focus and drive. The art's okay, there's some good panels and sequences and the whole book has a fast-paced feel. Every page is packed with detail and movement. It's supported by some solid colouring work that utilises a painterly, textural style to ground the artwork and make it feel very present, very real and close. I can't speak to the author's motivations in making this book. Your boy often talks about failed screenplays that end up converted into graphic novels in a bid to get noticed and then optioned back into a movie. While this book doesn't have the disconnected feel a lot of these second-hand comic stories seem to have, I do think the story would probably make a good movie or even a miniseries, something punchy and raw and violent, one episode per kill. The politics in this book are pretty heavy-handed. The big debate about politics and comics rages on nearly every day on Twitter, and it seems there will never be a consensus. I believe the reason for that is as much bad actors who want a schism as it is people refusing to agree on definitions before engaging in fiery debate about the topic. Politics have a place in comics, but not all comics and not all the time. You should know if you're buying a political comic beforehand. It shouldn't be a surprise. I shouldn't buy a book and then be ambushed with Orange Man Bad if that wasn't what was on the cover or if that wasn't the point of the book. By all means, make a book called Orange Man Bad and reap whatever whirlwind you can. I won't be buying it, but every comic doesn't have to cater to every person. You should want your book to appeal to as wide of an audience as possible, but if you want to disenfranchise potentially 50% of your possible audience, you can absolutely do that. Anyone buying the AOC or Bernie comics, anyone buying the Obama issue of Spider-Man or the Trump issue of Savage Dragon probably had a good idea of what they were getting themselves in for. Comics don't have to be completely devoid of politics. Politics is downstream from culture. I'd argue it's impossible for all comics to be devoid of all politics all the time. I was expecting some wokeness because it is current year and because the cover and the associated copy text on the campaign page. I wasn't ambushed by politics being present. I expected it. But if you're going to introduce this sort of stuff as a central or even as a support theme for your story, you can't be heavy-handed. The dialogue here doesn't support the nuanced views that need to be afforded when dealing with these issues. Yes, slavery was bad. It still is, but nobody talks about that. Yes, the treatment of the First Nations people by the white Americans was atrocious. No one is disagreeing with that. The characters in this book sometimes sit around and just talk about old grievances and how bad they were, but that topic really isn't up for debate. No one is seriously celebrating the European slave trade or the violent death of native nations. So why is the writer using precious page real estate to remind us of this stuff? It feels forced. It feels like an attempt to be topical and cater to a worker crowd. One that we should remember doesn't really buy comic books. I'd rather that time have been spent on more action scenes or more scenes of social combat, verbal interactions with the characters shine by overcoming social and professional obstacles. We all love a good and well-deserved verbal takedown. More of that and less redundant bad thing is bad takes, please. Many crowdfunded books are, by the very nature of the model and its distribution, self-contained. Crowdfunded creators don't have decades of character development to draw upon. They have very limited time and space to get you to care about the protagonist so you can then, in turn, care about the story. Keone Freed is not a very likable character. She's introduced through some unsolicited exposition, dropped into heavy-handed crisis so we can see how human and real she is. She gets her dog drunk, appears to have a liquid diet, and swims in the Potomac River. Her house is a mess. She named her pet after a white dog of a man she dated in college and is best friends with the president, the first female president. She's also a member of a super elite investigation task force, given authority over FBI agents in a federal case, and is an expert diver. There's no 100% agreed upon definition of Mary Sue, but I think Keone is in the running this year. Some of the dialogue is really stiff. It's that kind of unnecessary expositionary talk between two people that doesn't happen in real life. J. Scott Bell has a great example of it in his excellent book, How to Write Dazzling Dialogue, where he transcribes a conversation from an episode of Perry Mason. In it, the characters tell each other information they both know, explicitly for the benefit of the audience. Bill gives it a pass because of time restraints on the show, but comics are the most versatile storytelling format ever created. There is no need for this kind of dialogue, particularly when it's just there to make a point about the writer's preferred politics. The art looks cramped and rushed in some places. 
It'd be churlish of me to cherry pick a bunch of panels that fall down in the art department. Once again, I have to concede that the artist, Ian J. Miller, is already doing a better job of it than me. But as hectic and jam-packed as the action sequences are, some of the in-between stuff is very off. I think part of it is the thick, very loose line work that helps the action sequences but harms the social interactions. Objects and people in the background have the same line thickness as those in the foregrounds, leading to an awkward, too full art style in some places. While I enjoy the overall feel and theme of the story, I really feel like it would have benefited from a slight push into the supernatural, having the Avenger pull off feats that are just beyond human, making it seem more like the spirits of his ancestors are helping him in his quest for vengeance, or maybe he has some kind of lower or evil spirit inhabiting him, moving him into slasher moving monster territory. In one scene, the Avenger talks about wearing a ghost shirt that stops bullets from harming him, but we never actually see it in action. It would have been cool to see some more authentic Native American lore incorporated as more than mortal feats and artifacts. I guess the creators wanted to play it straight, but I would have liked even the hint that there is something more going on here. I kept looking for it, but never really found it. The story plays fine without it, but I always want a little more of the extraordinary in my stories. This book is not doing well on Indiegogo. It's sitting at around an eighth of its funding goal with about 20 days left on the campaign. I want to talk about why I think that is. I haven't seen much move it at all on it lately, nor have I seen any of the creators on indie comic shows or live streams. Everyone has a different woke threshold. Most woke content has an anti-white bias to it. When every other piece of media implicitly signals you are bad because of the colour of your skin, you take notice. You don't believe that because you're not a child, but you see the agenda being pushed. What about ism right now doesn't help anyone. There isn't a single positive depiction of a white man in this book. It is a book about a black woman chasing a Native American killer across America, so naturally there isn't necessarily going to be a lot of space for white men. I reviewed a comic called Shaka, written by Warren Duncan and there wasn't a single white person in the book. There's no white people in Lion King or Aladdin either, nor should there be. There are no white men in Agrabah and no people of any sort in the Lion King. Shaka takes place in an African nation, and the story doesn't deal with the conflict between the native people and the Europeans, at least in this stage of Shaka's life. The only white men depicted in Freed are arrogant rich elitists or drug addicts and murderers. So why is this a problem? Does every demographic need fair or even positive representation? Of course not. That way lies identity politics as God, people worshipping at the feet of the progressive stack. We know that SJWs don't buy comics, not in the volumes that matter, the volumes that sustain an industry. Woke SJW comic book crowdfunders rarely do the kind of numbers that comics great and indie titles pull in. The demographics of the comic reading audience has broadened drastically, but in the American market, a market that is still at least 60% white, you might be doing yourself a disservice by portraying all white people, and all white men in particular, as all bad all the time. The most positive depiction of a white man I saw in the book was this newscaster that featured in one panel. He's got a job and a suit and everything. Like Lion King or Aladdin or Sinbad or Monkey or The Seven Samurai, you could create a story that has no legitimate space for white men and still have an audience, still sell that story to an audience. Night Thrasher is Zack's favourite comic book character and weeaboos exist after all. You can also ignore white presences in your story and have them be sidelined, present but unimportant. That's still valid. Plenty of stories have been told where white people are present but not critical to the narrative. In these instances, you have little to no white representation. They've essentially been ignored. There is a neutral attitude towards them. What I think is dangerous, dangerous to your profits, dangerous to your bottom line, and dangerous to your book sustainability as a revenue stream, and part of a larger stream that funnels customers from project to project, is to demonise white people, particularly white men, in every instance. We have seen every day and in every way that disenfranchising and vilifying 60% of all customers is not a profitable model. I can't imagine many white people wanting to pay money to read a book where the characters take time out of a time-sensitive life or death chase to wax lyrical about the white devils and the horrible things they did centuries ago. Many of the comments I've seen on Twitter regarding this book is that people think it looks too woke, too political. I've seen people say they won't be backing it because of those reasons. People want a good story, they want escapism and entertainment. No one wants to be preached at anymore. Netflix recently went woke and lost $9 billion. Disney's doing the same thing, and their profitability was a small fraction this year that it was last year, going from billions to millions. The creative team of this book, then, has to consider, going forward, what matters most to them. Profitability, or telling the story they want to tell the way they want to tell it. You can spend money creating whatever vanity projects you want, to fulfill whatever agenda or goals you have, but you can't make people love what you have. You can't expect them to meet you halfway with the same sort of enthusiasm you have. Do you want to sell books, or do you want to tell contentious stories? I doubt this story could have been told without referencing the terrible crimes committed against the Native American people, crimes committed by Europeans and European-descended Americans. But the book is full of little jabs at the white race. Every other page, there is another low blow that demonizes whites and subtly casts blame for the actions of a few on all of them. It's tiresome. 
It pulls you from the narrative every time it happens. No one is denying the awful things that happened long ago, and if the story had just focused on these events as historical injustices, it might have been able to deliver what it promised, a race against the clock against the nemesis of almost supernatural ability as he targets significant citizens in a bid for revenge for his people. Instead, you find yourself anticipating the next time collectivism is invoked, and you are asked to shoulder the blame for something that happened centuries before you were born, or the next time your race is denigrated and represented or bad or wrong by proxy. I've commented previously on the effect of staring into the abyss, that when you are steeped in the SJW agenda, you see it everywhere. You become a kind of anti-SJW, who can see their agenda, their racism, in almost any piece of media. It's a dishonest person who denies the Overton window on woke is continually shifting to the left, leaving many of us behind. Is this book a response to that wokeness? Is it less woke than I think it is? Is this a case of when every comic is woke, no comic is woke? Ultimately, it's the responsibility of the creative team to gauge trends, to do some market research into the genres and niches their book intends to fill. Woke comics haven't sold well traditionally. The issue here is, is this book really woke by modern standards? Even without reading the blurbs and the copy text, the cover lets you know the book is about a conflict between this man and this woman, and they are heavily visually typed. It's a black woman fighting a Native American man. In this day and age of identity politics and the grievance culture associated with the progressive stack, I think that might be enough to stay some readers' hands. I was expecting plenty of work when I saw this project. I knew the story could be told without it, but I didn't really have faith that the creators would avoid the elephant in the room, not in today's comic industry. If they've managed to actually do that or not, is something you'll have to decide for yourself.